nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. In this presentation, I would like to talk about band-to-band -band tunneling transistor simulations that have been done in Omen. And first of all, I'd like to motivate why one might be interested in band-to-band -band transistors. On the top, you see a current density plot where the red streak is the charge, uh, the current density through the device as a function uh, in the space, I mean, of a conduction band and a valence band uh, where the MOSFET is modulated by a gate. And you see as the channel is opened, as now it's getting opened here, the current increases as a function of gate voltage. And the slope that it will increase with is 60 millivolt per decade. And there's fundamentally nothing you can do about making that 60 millivolt volt in a MOSFET to be 20 or 10. And why would you want to make that smaller? That slope basically determines how much voltage do you need to turn on or off a device. It gives you the voltage swing you have to have in your device to turn it on and off. So if you want to add, turn your device off by a factor of a thousand, that gives you the voltage you need to swing at least over which slope to turn this device on or off. And if you, you would like to reduce that voltage because that voltage swing determines the, the loss, the standby power, and the switching power you need to operate this device. So you like to operate in the smallest possible voltage swings and achieve the best on-off switch. Okay. Now, in a band-to-band -band tunneling device, oh, sorry, going back, you can actually show that analytically in a MOSFET, the best thing you can achieve is 60 millivolt volt per decade because it really has to do with a thermionic tail of, a, of the distribution of carriers. Now, if you look at a band-to-band -band device, band-to-band -band tunneling device, uh, you have thermionic tails in the device, clearly, but the current path is really determined by the top of a valence band and the bottom, bottom of a conduction band. So you sort of can shut off your thermionic tail by having a presence of a valence band or a conduction band that trims, so to speak, that tail off. Okay, so you can, by design of gates, narrow the energy range over which you want to conduct. And that means you can actually reduce the voltage swing, this so-called sub-threshold uh, slope, and make it steeper than 60 milli millivolt per decade. So here on the bottom you see this animation where indeed the device is turning off at much smaller voltages than co the comparable MOSFET device. Okay, so that would be a desirable thing to have. Now, band-to-band -band tunneling devices also have their own difficulties, but that is one appeal that they have, that you can possibly turn them on more rapidly than you could turn them off, turn a MOSFET off. So there's a lot of research being undertaken now on these so-called steep sub-threshold swing devices. So now let's look at uh, a device structure where we don't need phonons. Because if you did this in silicon, this band-to-band -band tunneling, you went from a direct gamma point to an indirect X point, you would need phonons to take you properly from one band to the next. But if you have a direct gap material, like indium arsenide, you don't need phonons. 
So let's study cases first where we don't need phonons. So in Indian Marshall, we don't need phonons, and it's a but we also know that it's a highly non-parabolic conduction band, and we know that we also need realistic valence band features. So we take a chunk of P plus indium arsenide and a chunk of N plus indium arsenide over a distance of 25 nanometer and consider an ultra-thin body of height of 5 nanometers. Okay. In the previous lectures I had shown briefly on how to construct a dispersion of a nanowire for the conduction band, it's pretty easy. You basically have two modes that exist in this five nanometer quantum well, so to speak. There's a ground state and an excited state, so to speak, but it has now a propagation property. It has a dispersion. And the holes look rather more complicated. So that is resembling of the whole um, dispersion we discussed in the whole transport uh, lecture. Now, there's this k-dependence, and if you try to see how these band edges that are shown in blue move as a function of momentum, so we can turn the momentum loose, the, co the, veil the conduction band edge moves rather rapidly because it has a high slope, and the dispersion of the holes is much weaker dependent on k. It's much heavier. It doesn't move a whole lot. And shown in the center, is the transmission coefficient through the structure. So as you ramp up k, you kind of shut off the device. Okay, so here at k equals zero, you run through fine, and at k equal uh, a large number, you have 0 0.35, 0 0.4, you basically have to shut off the channel. So you will have a channel that is momentum dependent, and of course voltage dependent on what kind of voltage you drop here. So you must do energy and momentum integration properly to do transport here. So now let's consider a realistic structure. We might look at a 40 nanometer gate, an 8 nanometer indium arsenide quantum well that sits on a substrate. <coughs> and let's look how the bands would look like. So here is the band edge diagram, and we compute a realistic Poisson solution in 3D uh, where the doping is 10 to the 18 in the contacts. And you basically see as a function of gate voltage how the bands are controlled in the center of the device. And you also see that there is a significant slope still here in the center of the device, except for the very high gate biases. But there's a strong slope. All right. <coughs> 